Uh, one statement that came up in our discussions this week was, all emotions are pleasurable. Uh, as an actor, I found that interesting because mm -hmm. uh, in my work, I'm always chasing after emotions. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was challenging for me to think about, is every emotion actually positive? And I was mm -hmm. hoping to get your perspective from a uh, psychological stance. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So when you said, as, a, as an actor, mm -hmm. right, or teaching acting, you're chasing after emotion. Yeah. So as a clinical psychologist, I'm chasing after emotion as well. all the time as well, yeah. both in the person I'm working with clinically, but then even in my own experience, what am I feeling as I'm sort of sitting with this person? So emotion is a really core kind of part of how we experience an other, mm. how we experience ourselves, uh, obviously. So. What strikes me is this idea that is all emotion pleasant or pleasurable? And I think I would suggest that it's not always pleasurable. Mm. But in the absence of emotion, we will very quickly take negative emotion over the absence of emotion. Mm. So for many people, I think they would probably more likely choose positive emotion over negative emotion. So they'd probably choose to be happy over choosing to be angry. Hmm. Although there are some that may choose that. But oftentimes, and this is this, the, especially as we relate to social media, um, I think oftentimes we're so immediately charged and we feel compelled to immediately respond. And then we're sort of responding to these really sort of very primary emotions, more like Ekman would talk about primary emotions. So anger, fear, sad, right? Um, happy even. Mm. And so I think oftentimes social media is pulling for that very quickly. Mm -hmm. And, and the, 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 I think that probably the more troubling piece for the parts of social media that I'm concerned with is that there really oftentimes isn't that capacity to kind of slow that process down mm -hmm. and really be more mindful about what it is we're actually feeling rather than responding to that really primary feeling. That's interesting. Um, do you think that <clears throat> the social media is bringing out tenden uh, tendencies that are intrinsically human, or do you think there's almost a reversion to primal instincts that maybe mm. we abandoned long ago and mm. now we're, we're, we're de-evolving in a sense? <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, that's a great question. Um, on its face, I would say it, it's pulling for things that humans have always experienced. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything completely new to it. Okay. But I do suspect that what's new to it is that we're able to interact with people that we're not connected with like you and I are right now. Mm -hmm. And so my way of responding to you as a person that I care for and enjoy spending time with mm -hmm. is very different than even someone I would consider a friend, right? Like in a Facebook world, but maybe isn't really a friend, maybe is sort of a distant acquaintance or someone from the distant past. And now I'm interacting with them uh, kind of almost outside of actual relationship. And so mm. I'm saying things, but have no sense of awareness of how that person's actually going to receive them. I'm just sort of spewing my own kind of affect, you know, back onto the screen at times, not all the time, but at times. And I suspect that that doesn't really do much to respect what an actual relationship would look like. So that's part of what I'm concerned about, I suppose. Yeah. From, from an acting standpoint, I find that concerning because a lot of bad acting comes from people who just don't listen to their partner. Mm -hmm. They get in their mind that these are the lines I have to memorize, this is what mm -hmm. I have to spew out, and there's no reciprocity mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really, for me, the key difference between uh, a worthy performance and one that is not, mm -hmm. is taking in the other mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned one time uh, the idea of uh, object constancy, mm -hmm. uh, and we're talking specifically about BuzzFeed, where there mm -hmm. was no, no, not, sorry. It was an article on BuzzFeed mm -hmm. about Snapchat, where there was uh, two young girls who were on it all day, would go through 40 Snapchats in a, mm -hmm. in a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, are we essentially training ourselves to operate at a more infantile mm -hmm. level of discourse with other human beings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we may be. So Margaret Mahler, probably back in the, 40s or 50s mm -hmm. uh, 
wrote a lot about uh, object relations, but specifically within that, she was talking a lot about infant development and this idea of object constancy. And so object constancy really refers to the notion that when infants are quite young, uh, when the caretaker isn't in the room, it's as if the caretaker doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. right? And then there becomes a, a certain developmental kind of period where uh, children who have been nurtured reasonably well begin to internalize that object, right? So now if the mom or the dad are in the other room next door, the child still knows that they're there, right? They, mm -hmm. They're holding them kind of internally. And that interesting, the interesting piece about that BuzzFeed article was this idea that there's such contentless communication now mm -hmm. that it's almost like a ping, right? Are you there, mm -hmm. right? And if you're there and then you ping back and I'm here, it's kind of like, well, you're alive and I'm alive, but there isn't much more than that. It's almost like this need to kind of get the ping to mm -hmm. know you're alive, but also to kind of know that I'm alive too. And so that does feel like that very primitive way of communicating, right? It's, it's contentless and it's really kind of just all about am I, I exist and you exist, but there's not a whole lot more that goes on in those environments. Mm -hmm. There's a great Louis C.K. monologue that he yeah. has on Conan um, where he's talking about how much he hates cell phones and how he doesn't want his daughter to have a cell phone and how he was driving down the street one day and he yeah. felt this wave of sadness coming on to him and he was going to get on his phone tweet, Facebook, whatever, to try and delay that sadness. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to put my phone down mm -hmm. and I'm going to let this sadness wash mm -hmm. over me. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, and I felt it. And then you know what happened is happiness came in and replaced it. Mm -hmm. Do you think, how, how should we navigate as Christians and Christian scholars dealing with uncomfortable situations Mm -hmm. um, for our students. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, in Dana Boyd's book, she talked about how this protective instinct of helicopter mm -hmm. uh, parents would insulate students from outside exposure. Are, are we getting to a point in society where that is starting to harm us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great question. So I'm, I'm of the sort now, you know, the, the ship has sailed, right? Mm -hmm. So technology, <laughs> social media, cell phones I and mean, these out things there. are they're out there yeah. and there's a lot of good that come from them right? absolutely I mean, I'm yeah. not anti any of those things mm -hmm. but I think your point is well taken which is as a, particularly as a parent this need to sort of be attentive to the destructive potentialities of these technologies as long as as well as sort of uh, encouraging the productive aspects of these technologies as well mm -hmm. And so as I've been thinking about this more and more, uh, and, and I think especially in response to our conversations with, with Alan Jacobs, um, I'm kind of wondering what it would look like if we sort of approach social media in particular, other forms of technology too, but social media in particular, uh, more mindfully with maybe sort of the fruits of the spirit in mind. What would it look like if we approach social media uh, with a resistance to just sort of this uh, immediate need to respond, right? This, this, because it does pull for that. Social media pulls for the immediacy of yeah. response, right? And what would it look like if we were deliberate about postponing response? Mm -hmm. What would it look like if we didn't necessarily click the like button or the unlike button or whatever it is, you know, the dislike <laughs> button or the angry face or whatever it is on something like, like Facebook in particular? And what would it look like if we resisted the, the tendency to immediately respond mm -hmm. and maybe worked a little more at uh, self-control, mm -hmm. goodness, gentleness, kindness. And I think these are the kinds of things that could transform the way we engage social media in particular. Mm. Because if we're doing those things, if we're deliberately thinking about those things, I don't think we're gonna get caught in the trap, right? Of mm. the immediate response, the contentlessness <laughs> communication, right? we probably much more likely uh, be oriented towards responding in a way that's productive and, and actually meaningful. And, and avoiding the addictive nature of some of these uh, technology uses as well. Mm. Now, that's funny to hear you say because that is something Tim and I actually talked about the mm. other day about you know, what is our reason? What's our intention for responding in the way we do? Mm -hmm. and, and looking at it from a perspective of fruits of the spirit. Am I looking to 
uh, respond in love and grace and kindness, or am I doing it just to feel right or to feel justified? Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit to the addictive nature? What is going on chemically or psychologically when someone is getting that response mm -hmm. on Facebook? Is it yeah. is it would it be silly to compare it to a drug or? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, complete ignorance on yeah. this point. No, me. not at all. It's actually very interesting because uh, there aren't a lot of studies out that I know of on this, but one study in particular that really uh, struck me was uh, they would put subjects in a scanner, right? right. And as they would be actively scanning their brain, mm -hmm. one of the things they'd be assessing is what would happen for them when someone would like a post mm -hmm. or someone would make a positive comment on a post. And what they found is it activated the same pleasure centers of the brain that many drugs do. Huh. And, and one of the primary uh, kind of areas of the brain that uh, regulates dopamine production was particularly impacted. So we like dopamine. Humans love dopamine, right? Yeah. We get a big dopamine rush when we eat a good meal or have sex or these kinds of things that we feel are very pleasurable. Yeah. And what was fascinating to me is someone simply liking your, your, your post or your picture or whatever else it might be actually causes a dopamine sort of flood. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know that it would be unreasonable to say that it's possible that some of these can hold the same addictive qualities as other drugs. Mm -hmm. Now, again, that kind of speaks to if we're more kind of mindfully engaging in these mediums are we being a little more careful about what we're doing with them and are we kind of delaying that a bit so that maybe we're, we're not so just mindlessly uh, responding to that like or responding to that thumbs up or whatever else it may be. One question, um, you brought up Dr. Paul Ekman who we study um, you, and developed the facial action coding mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. so that we could tell universal emotions and his idea, I, I don't have to explain it to you but those at home, mm -hmm. was that we all express uh, emotions the same way. It, cultures may determine uh, when or how um, those uh, emotions come out, but when they do, they're universal. With the same idea that we export American culture, do you think um, culturally there might be a danger of exporting the way we express mm -hmm. emotion? Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially infecting other cultures with, with the norms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that I have an answer to that. Uh, <laughs> I, I suspect that it's very possible, right, to mm. the degree that there are some things that are kind of culturally impacted. Some of Ekman's theories now, interestingly, are being kind of reevaluated mm -hmm. to see how much uh, we still agree with them. But it does seem like to some degree there are some sort of universal expressions of an emotional experience. At least it does seem that way. Um, and to what degree are we kind of exporting sort of a westernized version of that mm. internationally? It's interesting. But uh, it is interesting, too, that the, the little facial expression, expressions on Facebook that you can kind of, you know, they kind of go back to Ekman's, some of Ekman's basic kind of emotional experiences. Yeah, they do. He was actually an advisor on Inside Out. So, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. One last question. Um, if you could make one change to a social media technology to produce um, better outcomes for human flourishing. Mm -hmm. What do you think you would change? Yeah, that's fascinating. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I might take two. Okay, right? uh, that's fair. I've sort of been thinking about what it would look like, uh, particularly on social media. And again, I feel like I have to say, I'm not opposed to social media, right? I, mm -hmm. but, but particularly on social media, what it would look like to have sort of a jig, like an app that you could put onto your phone or on your computer, mm -hmm. that when you made a comment, right, on someone's post, that it would delay the comment, mm -hmm. and maybe like six hours later, or, you know, an hour later, 12 hours, whatever would work for you, uh, it would sort of remind you that this comment's there, and do you still want to send it? Mm -hmm. And if it would, could it delay us to, to some extent that we might be able to sort of uh, slow that process down and, and be more cautious? Um, the other one, and, and I think people are doing this, I think young people are doing this more and more, which is uh, they have more private accounts. So there are private accounts that are for their actual friends, right? People that they actually have contact with and connection with. Yeah. And then more public accounts, which are acquaintances and friends of friends and all these other things that, you know, people that we really aren't particularly connected to. 
And I do wonder sometimes with, with social media in particular, what it would look like if we either sort of restricted uh, our, our, you know, our friend list or whatnot to people that we actually have connection with, people mm -hmm. that we actually do sort of want to stay closer to, mm -hmm. rather than these sort of acquaintances that prior to social media we would never see, never talk to. You know, the, the guy you went to high school with 30 years ago yeah. that you would never stay in touch with now, not because you dislike them, but just because your worlds have completely sort of gone in separate, separate directions. Yeah. And now there's almost this tendency to kind of feel like, well, there is some kind of connection because we're connected now on Facebook and I kind of see what's going on with him and his family. But I don't really know what's going on with him. I don't know what his life is like, right? I don't hmm. know to what degree this stuff's all curated and yeah. what goes on to Facebook or Insta or whatever is 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 really true. So uh, I, I would kind of wonder what it might look like if we did rein that in a little bit or if we had a separate, more private account. Uh, in my own life, uh, I had a Facebook account and I ended up just finding it to be uh, too demanding and too oppressive and too frustrating. And mm -hmm. I really got fatigued, frankly, of reading everyone's opinions about things and I don't really <laughs> care what their opinions are, right? Yeah. And so I shut the whole thing down and then I found that um, there were some people I wanted to stay in contact with, right? mm -hmm. some family members that lived out of state or some actual close friends that I, uh, that maybe don't live in my neighborhood but are yeah. close enough that I wanted to maintain connection with. And so now I have a Facebook account under a, a fake name <laughs> and a different email address, and I have 10 friends on <laughs> Facebook, right? But there are people that I actually want to maintain these connections with. And what I've kind of found, interestingly, or so just anecdotally for myself, is Facebook uh, is much less compelling now. Mm. I don't check it daily. I maybe check it every week, every several days. I don't know. Because it's just this small group of people. Yeah. And and although I want to stay connected with this small group of people, I don't have to I don't check it regularly because not a lot changes with that small group <laughs> of people, right? And I'm not really missing anything if I sort of wait several days. So mm -hmm. there is it's less compelling and, and I just don't feel that same drive to check it. And I think mm -hmm. that's actually for me much healthier. That's good. Uh, and and so I, it's just this anecdotal experience, but I do wonder if narrowing down the pool might help quite a bit. Mm. No, I think moderation is helpful. Mm. I, I had a similar experience where over break, I just commit to not checking it. Mm. And I am generally happier. Mm. And I mean, that's not necessarily true for everyone. Mm. But I think they do say it, it's starting to have a depressive effect for some millennials yes. because of that yes. comparison. Yes. We're putting these select moments of the best parts on our lives for everyone to see. Mm -hmm. And then everyone else is comparing the best mm -hmm. to the worst of our lives. And we say, why, why am I not here? It's just that age old kind of keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah, we were on a vacation recently and uh, we were in a beautiful national park with uh, my wife and one of my sons who was able to go. And, um, and we were having a great time, lots of great hikes. And it was so fascinating because uh, he was checking Insta quite a bit, right? And he was mm -hmm. seeing what his other friends were doing, you know, over spring break and whatnot. And I'm thinking, well, the only posts there are not from friends who didn't go out of town. They're only from the ones who went out of town, right? Mm -hmm. And my wife said, made a comment about, I'm not sure he's happy being here. A and I remember telling her, he's not unhappy about where he is. He might be a little unhappy about where he isn't mm -hmm. because he's able to make these comparisons. And, it, it, you know, without social media, frankly, he would have been very content to be there. And I think actually was pretty content to be there. Uh, and then after school was out, right, or, or I'm sorry, when school was back in session and he would see his friends again and they would kind of talk about what happened. But there wouldn't be all these images of what happened there. Again, were curated over the course of that time to make it look mm -hmm. like everything was, was great. And they would talk about it a little bit, but there wouldn't be that much emotional energy connected mm -hmm. to it, right? It would just be a story that someone told you know, the Monday after spring break was over, rather than these real-time photos kind of comparing experiences. And it actually made me kind of sad, uh, mm. frankly, that, that uh, it, it makes it harder to sort of be there and be there now and sort of take all of what now has to offer. I, I won't name drop, but we had a famous actor uh, come in and speak to the students recently. And he said, I, I have to practice um, contentment mm -hmm. because when I hit my big break, you know, I thought if I just get that television show, I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. And he said, now you could ask me story, ask me to tell a story about that time and I can't 
tell you that. Mm -hmm. I cannot remember because I was still waiting for that contentment. Wow. So I was never present. Wow. And so he said something my therapist told me just to help me be present in the moment is look at my surroundings and find something mm -hmm. that physically grounds mm -hmm. me. Um, and so I thought that was uh, very insightful. Yeah. The only other thing I very would powerful. say is, uh, you know, I think it's in the small, simple things that we do that affect the bigger picture. And so it's like, what if I just put that there mm -hmm. during our conversation? And I left mm -hmm. that out this entire time. What message am I sending to you other than mm -hmm. this could potentially be more important during our conversation than what I am receiving yes. from you? So, yes, absolutely. So all that to say, uh, thank you for connecting with me today in person. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you.